Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Welcome to Cavern Cyber Threats Are Looming, Leverage the NIST CSF webinar. We'll begin in about 60 seconds. Welcome everyone to Cavern Cyber Threats Are Looming webinar. We'll begin in about 30 seconds. Welcome everyone to Cavern Cyber Threats Are Looming Leverage the NIST CSF webinar. Today we have uh, two well-known uh, presenters. The first is Pulitzer-winning journalist Byron Ecohito. And I'll let you read some of his background, but he's very well-known in the whole cybersecurity space, one of the, uh, the prime influencers and one of the best respected uh, blogs. He also does uh, podcasts, articles, and, and videos. And after the webinar is over, I definitely refer you to some of his uh, articles, publications, and website. Just as an aside, uh, we've posted some of his material in the attachment section to this webinar. The second presenter will be Anupam Sahai, who's uh, Vice President of our Product Management at Caverin. He also has deep domain expertise in the whole SaaS cybersecurity risk management space. And he has a lot of familiarity with what's happening in the minds of the CISO and the minds of security operations in both large companies and small. Couple logistics. If you have any questions during the webinar, please go ahead and enter them in the, uh, the question window. We'll answer them as they uh, come up at the end. Um, we have published a uh, CSF technical mapping. It's available at the uh, Cavern website as well as the NIST website. As I said, there's also a host of additional information available. And we will have questions, as I said, at the end of the webinar. And with that, let me turn it over to Byron. Oh, thank you very much, David. Hi, this is Byron Akahito. I'm uh, happy to be here. It's a privilege to uh, visit with you all this morning. I follow this stuff 24-7, uh, basically. And uh, there's a lot out there. So let's. Uh, get right to it if I can make this slide work. There we go. So what we're going to do today is basically cover ground that will seem familiar, but there's a lot of white noise out there because there's so much going on. So what I hope to do is do some uh, high-level dot connecting for you um, to kind of frame the context a little better. And uh, I'd like to start kind of with you know, my perspective on this, because I'm not a technologist. I'm not a, a tech guy per se. I'm really a, a journalist. I got into this initially as a business news reporter uh, way back when, and I spent the early part of my career covering the Boeing company for the Seattle Times, and that's where I won my Pulitzer Prize in 1997. Uh, I did a whole series of stories about uh, Comp complex technology, which is a Boeing aircraft and, and a product flaw in, in the 737 in the rudder. So that's how I won the Pulitzer. And that opened a few doors, and I transitioned over to USA Today. They brought me in uh, right in the 2000, start of the uh, new century here, new millennium. And they wanted me to cover Microsoft because Microsoft was being sued by the Department of uh, Justice, and I happened to be in Seattle. So I did, I didn't know anything about software. And after a couple of years, this, in 2004, actually, I did my first, what I would refer to as my first cybersecurity story. It was about MS Blaster, this worm that went around the world. And they, eventually they blamed it for the big blackout on the Eastern seaboard. And from there, it's been pretty nonstop. I've, uh, I, I've, immersed myself in this topic. Um, so let's get right into it. So here's a, a several uh, recent 
metrics. Uh, the cyber threat is kind of hard to pin down, really, but it's not. I mean, it hard and it is and it isn't because there's so much metrics like these that go out uh, on a continual basis. A lot of it's estimates, so you have to kind of uh, pick and choose and kind of read between the lines in a sense. But the the overarching story is that since I've been covering this, the threats and the breaches have continued on a steady curve here uh, up. And it's amazing because the the more we delve into uh, digital transformation, you know, now we're into cloud and mobile devices. You know, five, seven, eight years ago, it was, you know, just uh, desktop, laptops. Um, and now we're fully in, and, and, you know, it started back with uh, software as a service. Now we have infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, cloud computing, and everything's moving really fast toward the Internet of Things and cloud computing. And what's in the wake of all this, these metrics really do uh, kind of, they're not overstated. I think um, you will, you know, run into these, uh, the badness out there um, on many levels. So let's go to the next slide here. So just to bring it down to a micro view, these are some very recent reports that have come out. The Pentagon. Uh, this is how much they, they get 13 billion weaponized emails per year. So they know that because they're actually blocking the vast majority of those. But what that tells you is that the scale of these attacks to get one phishing attack in is that is that that volume and and that is not just the Department of Defense and the obvious large targets. There's another report came out that the U, uh, UK towns, 395 town councils. Um, uh, get hit at the same scale, you know, sort of up for their size. They, they're, they're fielding these phishing attacks all day long, every day. Uh, and of course, we know that, uh, we'll come back to this later, but Uber lost 58 million customers. This is just one of the later uh, high profile breaches, and that was due to uh, operating in this environment where they're trying to do DevOps and develop the latest apps to make their company more efficient. You know, it's an app-based company, basically. And uh, this, along the way, the bad guys are paying attention because there's so many places where information uh, logons uh, can get tapped into and then you get to the crown jewels. Uh, the other big one, of course, not too long ago, last fall, was Equifax. Uh, same sort of thing, um, you know, the bad guys recognized, even though Equifax had insurance, spent, you know, millions on the best perimeter defenses and layer defenses, intrusion detection, et cetera, they still got breached um, and it, because there was an opening. Actually, there's many openings, but the one that the bad guys went through happened to be an open source framework that uh, they accessed through a phishing attack. So, and here's another micro view. This is a, a view that, like I said, there's it's so much going on that it becomes white noise. Uh, you know, election meddling. You can you can you can drill down into that um, and see how botnets are being used by the Russians to meddle in elections. Power grid hacking. This is more. There's a lot more news the last two years about this in, in the last year. Um, you know, sort of the big one was in the Ukraine, got not, their power grid got knocked down about a year and a half ago, twice. But more recently, there's been other attacks. And before that was Stuxnet, which is the, uh, the U.S. and Israeli, uh, you know, nation state backed forces getting into the Iranian uh, industrial controls. But uh, there's a lot going on there, and you can see what's happening is the nation states are positioning themselves uh, sort of like the nuclear buildup of a generation ago. They're, they're, they're setting themselves up to be in position to knock out infrastructure. And crypto mining craze is just the most recent. I mean, you can look up, you can look this up now. I'll go over it a little bit more uh, in an, another slide to come here. 
and uh, dis de denial, dis uh, distributed denial of service attacks are again like everything else, um, scaling up, getting more, getting uh, smarter, more innovative. To the, and the good guys are keeping up. You know, there there there's millions of I think it's probably billions of dollars being put into defenses, but the bad guys continue to just make gains. Maybe we'll cover this a little bit more. So the because of all this white noise, um, I imagine most of you in the audience are in a position to uh, maybe influence how your organization can posture the, themselves better to deal with this. I, you need to. If you don't, you become the low-hanging fruit for the cyber criminals. And um, a lot of it has to do with really basic stuff, uh, figuring out where your, your, what your systems are, what your valuable data is, and then going through this, understanding some of this material uh, in a way that you can determine um, you know, what's important to your company, what is really a material risk to your organization. And I have here kill chain assessments because this is a, I've seen this referred to, I think Lockheed came up with this when they got breached about three years ago. But really it is, we're in a day and age where it's not just, I mean, you need to have perimeter defenses, firewalls and endpoint protection, mobile protection, et cetera. But the assumption is that, and you need to have stuff inside their defense, but the bad guys are getting in and this is, different areas where you can, um, you should be paying attention to do, doing due diligence. It, it starts at the top of reconnaissance. By that I mean, uh, what that refers to is your employees are being uh, profiled uh, on link, you know, on their social media, LinkedIn, however they're, they're putting out their business contacts, that's all being collected, even their personal contacts, to serve these phishing attacks, right? And then it gets to the payload delivery, which is, uh, used to be and still is uh, corrupted attachments and web links, but now there's fileless attacks and there's pure social social engineering attacks. So th the end result is the bad guys get in one way or another, whether they get in because they have a account access or they are able to plant a malware, and the code gets executed. And once they're inside, it's all about getting a foothold and maintaining it, and uh, you know reporting out to a command and control server. And then from there, uh, just carrying out whatever their mission is and staying uh, undetected for as long as possible. So these are some of the areas where the bad guys are innovating sort of at the front edge. So this is the low-hanging fruit from, from the elite hackers. And when I may say elite hackers, what I'm referring to is um, you know the nation state guys yes they're out there but there's also and i don't there's a blurred line here but there's also the big organized criminal the uh, syndicates that are doing it for the cash mainly and you know these guys are in russia and ukraine and turkey and china and, and um so what they're doing is again it's the start of this always is social engineering the human is the weakest link in this because you can we're all so busy and we're all so susceptible and we're all, you know, we, we don't critically think as much as we used to. And so we're susceptible to being tricked to clicking or doing something or, you know, turning over control to the bad guys. And so what they're doing now is they know how to get in. Once they get in, they're finding other areas that have been there all along, but are just completely ripe, wide open attack surfaces that, full of vulnerabilities that have been sitting there since the beginning. Windows administration tools like uh, Active Directory and PowerShell, and there's a long list of them. Once they get in, they can, and once they get, you know, privileged access, then they can act as a Windows administrator and t leverage the tools that Windows and Microsoft put in there to make, you know, networking, you know, efficient and possible. So they're just Im imitating the administrator and taking over and doing all these inside attacks. Um, um, the open source vector has opened up. Uh, Equif I mentioned Equifax, 
you know, a year before that, there was the heart bleed, uh, heart bleed and uh, the shell shock. All this open source stuff that was, you know, gobbled up and leveraged and now has become mainstream. Even the big tech companies are, are using open source because, you know, it's cheap and it's convenient and, and it's all embedded in our networks. Well, guess what? We never took a look at the vulnerabilities in there. So now that's what's happening, vulnerability research in that area and exploitation. And cloud security and DevOps, um, you know, most of you probably are starting to hear about this if you're not fully Im immersed in this. This is, again, the whole area of uh, leveraging cloud computing and um, services, infrastructure as a service, you know, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, and then, you know, developing apps really fast. That's the DevOps piece. None of that fits, how would I put this? None of that fits well inside of the traditional perimeter defense or even the layered defense of business networks as we've come to know it and build it to this day. So something else needs to be done there because it's just getting really crazy. And this hardware IoT is like the next thing coming, right? It's, uh, I think we'll go over that quickly. But basically, there's vulnerabilities in the Intel chips that now it's going to be the next area that opens up. So with all that going on, um, you know, there are drivers and, well, I, let me put it this way. I mean, all that adds up to is the the bad guys, if you will, have this gap, and the gap's not really shrinking. It's still big in terms of they're able to innovate and leverage all these new openings. And while doing that, still take full advantage of all the old openings that people have left unpatched or whatever. So the the bad guy the the gap's just big, as and the opportunities are increasing, and even as the good guys are you know innovating and or trying to you know basically stick fingers in dike the dike basically, uh, you know it's a ninety billion dollar industry the cavern and you know everybody can think of Intel, uh, all the other big security companies Semantic they're all there's a there's effort being put into this but the gap remains big so what's happening what i have here on the screen is the regulators in the industry groups understand this but they they're you know they're responding in really methodical slow fashion and these what you're seeing a lot of this is really good stuff but it's going at a kind of glacial pace compared to um compared to what's actually happening out there and compared to what is actually the exposure out there and what, what actually is the material risk. So I would point you to, um, you know, the New York Department of Financial Services certification uh, rule that was something that happened. Well, the unusual thing about that was a couple things. One was that no, no, the state legislator didn't, legislature did not pass it. It was the department itself that was concerned about the financial uh, integrity of, um, of the integrity of the financial system of which New York is is a hub for the globe, right? So they've been they've imposed this certification rule for financial services institutions, and it's good stuff. It's you know a little not too prescriptive. It, it involves the NIST. Uh, it, it incorporates the uh, NIST standards, the National Institute of uh, standards and technology standards for how to approach getting a secure network. Uh, it, it probably incorporates some of the ISAC stuff too. I mean, it's a really good, thorough approach. Colorado has followed. So that's what's happening here in the U.S. And I would anticipate that that's the model going forward. We're going to see more state because the federal uh, lawmaking process is, you know, so dysfunctional at the moment. But the, the states are responding. Meanwhile, Europe, with, and this is a big deal, um, you know, that you could go to another seminar on, but the, the GDPR is their updated version of their Privacy Regulation Act. So that the major takeaway there is that it has very stri uh, sh um, sharp teeth 
you can you can get uh, a fine for violating for mishandling data if you're operating in Europe that uh, is based on your revenue. So we're going to see a case study that's going to go into effect in May. And knowing Europe, they will make a case study of someone, an example of someone, and then, you know, then it's, things are going to get interesting. So um, the other uh, the other thing that's happening is the insurance industry has recognized this as, uh, you know, a classic risk. Except it's not classic. I mean, it's a big risk. It's just as you know, bigger risk as, you know, being wiped out by you know an earthquake or something uh it's it, you know the chances of a business being materially disrupted by a cyber uh, event is right up at that scale so the business the cyber insurance industry recognized that as you know a opportunity for a new form of insurance risk mitigation the problem is what we just discussed it's not as easy as figuring out a fire or earthquake uh, it's very complicated. So what's happening is um, they want to measure this, right? The insurance underwriters want to measure this. And guess who has the best tools to measure this? It's the InfoSec vendors. So, But they're all competing, and everybody has their own little set of metrics. So there's sort of this um, – we're in the early part of this, but you're going to see more of this where security vendors are lending tools to the underwriters Risk, mitiga risk mitigation firms are going to come up with new models, and then they're going to start pricing this stuff better. And to get a good premium, you're going to have to, you know, do stuff like meet the new state regulations or something to that effect. So that's the halo effect. I think companies are going to start wanting to buy insurance to cover the last bit of this risk, but to do so, they're going to have to have a good network defense that's uh, viable. Um, so that'll help things, but it's going to take a while. Um, so what does it, all this mean for your organization? Um, you, I'm sure you've probably heard this if you've been paying attention, but yeah, I assume you've been hacked, even if you think you're doing a good job. And well, even if you're spending money on network defense, um, address the kill chain. Be aware that they, they're, there's spots you can look once the bad guys are inside, and they're likely inside. And then... Uh, very methodically, make yourself. Uh, let's put it this way: don't stop being low-hanging fruit. You know, make, make do some of the simple things progressively that will make you a more expensive target. Because then the bad guys will just move on to the next target that's easier to hit. So uh, I'm going to speed up here. So just uh, security by design. Practice uh, cyber hygiene. Some of these things you should be doing. Um, you know, you have to do due diligence and all this. It's buyer beware. There's, the good news is it's a $90 billion cybersecurity industry, so there's a lot of help out there. The, the sort of the, the challenge is that it's such a competitive industry, so you have to do your due diligence, find what fits for you. And I think I'm at 21 minutes, so I'm going to close up there. I hope. Um, I hope that was helpful in, in terms of trying to connect some of these dots. And I'll turn it over to Anna Palm at this point. Thank you, Byron. Um, so my name is Anupam Sahai. I'm Vice President of Product Management at Cavern. So what I will do today is uh, take you through how to deal with this uh, gloomy scenario that's out there. And Byron talked about it. The, the reality is that the cyber attackers are all over the place. They are compromising critical assets in the enterprise, the nation-level attacks going on, and, and the question becomes, what can we do about it? So, so there's bad news and good news, and let me start with the bad news. The bad news is there's no single magic pill that will solve the problem, and you need to have a combination of uh, security mechanisms, as it were, to address that. And uh, also, there is no, no way to protect everything. So you have to prioritize and focus on certain critical assets that are most important to you as a company, as a person, or as a nation. 
And uh, what I will take you through is one such framework. It's called the NIST Cybersecurity Framework that allows you to look at the various cyber threats and how to protect yourself to, to create what, what Byron called an expensive target so that you're not a low-hanging fruit when cyber attackers come looking for you. And so by doing some very basic fundamental things, you can actually secure your organization in, in a very, um, in a very secure, make it very secure. And research has shown that 99% of the attacks can be, can be prevented by taking very simple measures, very, putting together very simple security controls in place. So let's start with the, the NIST cybersecurity framework. What is it? It's, it's essentially a framework developed by NIST, which is a standard body, government body, that puts together a set of standards, methods, procedures to make it possible for any organization to prevent and address cyber risk. And you're talking about any kind of organization can, can benefit from it. It doesn't have to be somebody who's very much mature as an organization from a cybersecurity perspective. You can pick and choose the levels at which you want to start and, and then get mature and grow up the chain, go up the chain in terms of maturity. So what are the different components that comprise the cybersecurity framework? There are three elements, uh, uh, basic building blocks. One is the framework core, which you see on the right hand side, and this is really a set of cybersecurity activities, desired outcomes, and appli appli uh, applicable references that any organization can, can implement. And, and this framework, as I will talk about later, comprises of five functions that we will go into some more detail. The tiers, uh, implementation tiers is really the maturity of an organization. And, and you can start with tier level one and go up the chain to become more, as you become more mature and, and adaptive to dealing with changes. And, and the framework profile is, is really your, your current business needs. Not everybody needs to have everything. So depending on your requirement from an organization perspective, you can pick and choose what levels that you want to be compliant with. Okay, it looks like the first two buttons there. Okay. So this is uh, really telling you the number of implementation tiers that this cybersecurity framework has. And as you see, typically organizations will start with level one, which is a partial, partial level, and you get to a more learning, adaptive organization. And the maturity is really about how the organization views cybersecurity risk as being a core function. And, and today you have uh, executive roles being created, like CISO, that reports into the CEO. So the awareness and the, and the maturity of organization is growing as attacks are getting more severe, and, and that uh, recognition is, is happening across the industry. So what are the core elements that comprise the cybersecurity framework? So the first thing is that you need to understand what, what you want to achieve as an organization. Set your target goals. Understand what your current critical assets are so that you can focus on protecting them. Typical critical assets could be your intellectual property. It could be your customer information that you need to protect, or it could be your uh, public um, you know, revenue information. Whatever have you, you need to understand what are your critical goals or critical assets that you're trying to protect. And the next thing is to figure out where do you want to be as a target profile. And, and then understand where do you stand today and, and how do you get there by analyzing the gaps and prioritizing what needs to be done. So it's a very methodical approach to looking at the problem, understanding where you are, understanding your target, and then trying to get to a posture, trying to get to a cyber security or a cyber posture that you want to be as an organization to, to protect 
and secure your most critical assets. So I, I, I mentioned that there are five different elements that comprise the cybersecurity core framework, and they, they correspond to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And what this is essentially telling you is that to have a robust cybersecurity program, there needs to be elements of these five different stages. <coughs> Excuse me. You need to have elements of five different stages, not everything that comprise each stage, but at least elements of it, so that you are able to focus on identifying the critical assets, protect them, and then detect if any violations happen. And if, if the violations do happen, then you are able to respond to it and recover from it. So as you can see, there is a five different sets of mechanisms, security mechanisms that comprise a robust security program as per NIST cybersecurity framework. And if you dive into, into um, if you dive into one specific uh, rec rec recommendation, you're looking into the business environment of Identify, it lays down very specifically what organizations need to do to meet those uh, objectives. And again, this cybersecurity framework is, is very flexible. It's very, uh, it's very uh, open. And, and what it allows you to do is to use one or many frameworks like ISO, COVID, or NIST, et cetera, et cetera, to achieve that requirement, achieve that particular function or subcategory. So as an organization, you're not prescribed to follow one methodology or one framework. You can pick and choose controls as relevant to meet these requirements. So in terms of uh, as, as an organization, you want to have elements of all these different five mechanisms. You, you might start off at this, probably you are at this level where you've got more of identify and less of the other functions, and you set up a target profile to be here, which essentially means a certain risk posture or cyber posture. And, and really what risk is telling you is giving you a way to quantify risk so that which tells you what are the chances, what are the likelihoods of a, of a threatening event from happening that will compromise your critical assets. So it will allow you to quantify and provide that capability to do that. Now I'll talk about Cavern, which is an automation tool that allows you to implement something like a NIST cybersecurity framework, which has the capabilities to protect, monitor, and respond. And then we have some machine learning algorithms that allows you to learn from the past, from the history, to better understand what actions need to be taken. And uh, the automation tool will give you your overall risk posture, what are the elements that, that contribute to it, whether they are security issues or compliance issues. It can deal with both the aspects. You can set up a target score that you're trying to get to. Lower risk is better. Let's say you are at 51, you want to get to 20, and it will tell you what's the most optimal from a time and cost perspective method to get there. And, and, and this is an example that, uh, that was quoted in the NIST cybersecurity framework where organizations need to assess where does it stand from a maturity perspective for each of the five different mechanisms and the subcategories. And in this case, there was an internal assessment done and there were external auditors that were brought in to understand where the gaps are. And as you can see, that there were gaps that were found because certainly internal auditors can sometimes be a little uh, biased or there might be conflict of interest. So it's important to get a, a, three, a 360 degree view, both from internal and external stakeholders, to assess your current profile and figure out where you want to be from a target risk profile and how to get there. So Cabin, as I mentioned, has the cybersecurity framework automation tool that will help you get there. 
in optimal fashion so, so that you minimize the resources and time required to not only get there, but really do continuous monitoring to maintain your posture. So let me summarize that uh, both Byron and I want to reinforce the fact that cybersecurity threats are, re are real. They are happening today. In fact, uh, I was in a conference with the, with the FBI director and, and basically said that maybe 50% of the organizations know that they have been breached. The rest, they don't know that they have been breached. So literally what that means is that everybody should be thinking about this putting together a framework like NIST cybersecurity framework to ensure that they're protected and secure uh, and secure the critical assets. And uh, an, an automation tool like Cavern could help you get there. So let me pause here and, and see whether there are any questions. This is Byron. I'm just going to jump in with one thought I had here is that uh, the large enterprises are spending lots of money doing this. And as you can tell by Uber and Equifax, they're still getting breached. Even the big banks who's, who are farthest ahead still have to work on this. I think the small and medium sized companies, you know, have the hardest burden here, but they can and need to start addressing this. And there are there are ways you can do this through uh, managed security services. There's more of those services coming online for people to come and help you with this. So I keep that in mind. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, it really the the main vulnerability. That I, I'm sure Anupam would maybe agree with this, but the number one vulnerability is the human, the social engineering. So if you yeah. know you go wrong by starting there. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the number one uh, reason why breaches happen. It's not for lack of uh, sometimes the, the, the information about what vulnerabilities need to be breached is out there, but it's the delay in, in taking action, which is more people-related, that sometimes causes the breaches. And, and so having the mandate at the leadership level, having the visibility, having the resources to take timely action is very critical. Once you put together these uh, frameworks in place to ensure that you have visibility in, in terms of what's going on. Okay, so, so I see a couple of questions here. Um, first is, as an IS auditor, how can I access IT access? Byron, you want to take a crack at it, and then I can I can follow up with that. Well, what, I'm not, I don't know what an IS auditor is, but sorry. As an internal. IS auditor. So I assume that, uh, yeah, what is IS? Information Security Auditor, I assume. Okay, so let me, let, so as I mentioned earlier, as an auditor, I think the key thing here is to understand the maturity of the organization from a risk management perspective. And, and risk management, as I said earlier, is, is really an indicator or a way to manage the cybersecurity posture. Because you cannot secure all your assets, and risk tells you what is the risk level that you're willing to take uh, to deal with such cyber threats. And so once you understand the tolerance or the maturity of the organization, Ensuring a NIST cybersecurity framework like deployment where you, the, the organization has a combination of mechanisms is very key to making sure that you're able to not only protect your organization's assets, make sure that it's, there's a monitoring capability, there's a response capability so that you have visibility into what's going on what you might be protecting today may be compromised tomorrow, and we need to assume that all of these mechanisms are in place before we can say that we have a robust cybersecurity program. Yeah, this is Byron. I, I agree, and I think it uh, it really is a journey. No matter what uh, vertical you're in or what size your company, it really is. You have to get 
uh, you know, senior level buy-in. And I think the NIST actually addresses that and starts there kind of with how to, and gives guidance on how to do that. Because it really has to be part of the, the company culture going forward. Um, uh, then these other things can happen. Otherwise, it, you know, it'll prove ineffective. Right. Please type in your questions in the in the questions arena area of the of the bright talk presenter. If there are any questions. This is this is Dave. <clears throat> the one of the ones that came on. I I had my phone on mute earlier. Is uh, this is to Byron. Um, about two-factor authentication, a lot of talk about it. Um, you know, a lot of people look at it as ways to solve a number of these issues. Um, the, the counterpoint is that, as you hear everyone always complaining about two-factor authentication, there's different ways of, of implementing it and executing it. What, what's your view on it, and what's the most effective way forward? Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that uh, two-factor authentication um, is a really basic but very big bang for the buck uh, solution. And so once you start doing your due diligence about it, it'll force you to do other things. You know, where do you want to apply it? How you train your employees? How do you make it effective? But it, it's the why it's so powerful is that it um, covers a lot of these vulnerability areas where the bad guys are getting in and getting a log on, which is easy to do, and then, you know, getting elevated privileges and manipulating the open source vulnerabilities and the Windows tools, et cetera, et cetera. So, and they're going to continue to do that. There's going to be never-ending vulnerabilities in that area. The, first, they'll go look for the unpatched vulnerabilities that everybody knows about that are the real low-hanging fruit. So, I think you can apply them on different levels, you know, in your organization. And, you know, it's going to be less convenient, but it needs to be. And so that's, you have to develop that as part of your culture. So, Brian, while you're answering, uh, another question came in. Um, we're a long way from advanced technologies. And so how can, you know, a person realistically protect their company? And that's probably uh, answerable by both of you. Um, well, I think you just started. At the beginning, which is realizing we're in we're in a uh, internet centric digital economy, right? And everybody, I would I think probably every organization is uh, you know leveraging digital technologies, the cloud, mobile devices, and remote workers, right? There's no perimeter anymore. So it starts with realizing that, and then um, they, they, you know. It's kind of we just covered this, but the NIST standards is a way you can start taking baby steps and getting your uh, mind around it and getting your organization involved in it. You know, at, at the first level, first step, second step, third step, yeah, and so on. But really, is it's realizing that this. I've been covering this for 14 years, and when I first started writing about it, I told my editor, "Hey, this is a two-year story. Let me pay attention to this." It's 14 years later, and, and it's it's gotten. Uh, you know, it's escalated and gotten more complex. And like I said, this gap con continues to exist. I, I think we're going to close it, but it's, we haven't started the process just of, of narrowing the gap. And this is what it'll take. Every organization has to do this. Every individual has to do this. Anupam, any uh, last thoughts on, on the yeah, question no, about I, advanced I, I agree technology? With what, yeah, I agree with what Byron said that, as I mentioned earlier, about 98 to 99 percent of the breaches are avoidable by taking very simple steps. And, and this framework is a, is a great place to start. You don't have to be very mature or very advanced in technologies to really implement all of it. But start there and, and then work your way up in terms of uh, how you make it more adaptive and repeatable, etc. cetera. But, uh, but it's, it's not that... Um, Difficult if you want to start with some very simple steps and then go, uh, go up from there. Okay, so Anupam, thank you very much. Byron, thank you very much. Uh, for those listening, once again, we've posted uh, attachments and uh, some of the links. You can go to the, uh, the various assets that we've posted. 
And just uh, for your planning, in the next few weeks, uh, we'll be delivering a webinar that dives into uh, GDPR uh, readiness. So please take a look for that in terms of uh, date and time. Thank you again for our presenters, and uh, we'll sign off now. Thank you. Thank you.